machines get smarter, and this is something I'm going to address it to Nick Postrom, and I will introduce uh, him. He's a professor at the Faculty of Philosophy at the Oxford University. He's the uh, founder of, uh, found, uh, founding director of the Future of Humanity Institute, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Superintelligence, the book, and uh, he was named one of the foreign policy magazine's top 100 global thinkers. Nick, please tell us what happens when machines get, smart, get smarter. First of all, I want to thank, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and, and everybody who's uh, contributing to making this meeting happen. Um, so just while uh, we're getting the PowerPoint slide up, um, I, I can say something in general, but I want to sort of expand on some of the things that Max were saying in his talk. Um, and, and this um, grandiosely named uh, research center that that are on the Future of Humanity Institute, we, we see ourselves as in the business of, of, of trying to put a little acceleration uh, on in, into the wisdom side of this race between wisdom and technological capability. Um, so um, to start with, I, I want to introduce a, a concept that, that we find is useful for organizing our thinking. When, when you're really zooming out and looking at the human condition um, from a high altitude and look at the really big picture, this concept um, of what I call an existential risk. Um, there's never been an existential catastrophe in all of human history, uh, and there will only ever have been either zero or one. So an existential risk is one that imperils the survival of Earth originating intelligent life that could permanently destroy our future. So all the things that have gone wrong in human history, all the wars and earthquakes and plagues, um, from, from this strange perspective, or sort of like mere ripples on the great pond of humanity, when, when you tote up the total amount of suffering and happiness, at the end of time, these might not really register, whereas an existential risk would be important in that context. Um, so we define it as a risk that threatens the premature extinction of earth originating intelligent life or the permanent and drastic destruction of its potential for desirable future development. So this focuses our attention. Um, we have this very wide mandate, the future of humanity is to do that could be anything pretty much, but um, when you put on the lenses of focusing on existential risk, like almost all the concerns that preoccupy the world's population fall away because there just aren't plausible existential risks in there. And a very small number of concerns remain, um, which we can divide broadly into two categories. So risks arising from nature and risks arising in some way from human activity. Um, one early finding of this field of existential risk studies is that all the really big existential risks, certainly if we're talking about the time scale of 100 years or 200 years, are in this anthropogenic category. Um, you can see this quite easily if you just reflect on the fact that the human species has been around for a long time. We have survived earthquakes and firestorms and plagues and asteroid impacts for 100,000 years. So it's just not very likely that any of those things will do us in within the next century. Um, whereas we will, uh, in this century, introduce entirely new phenomena and new factors into the world. So if there are going to be existential risks in this century, they're most likely to come from these new things that we will do. And, and, and most of the possible ones there have to do with anticipated future technologies. Um, and another way to look at this is, is to consider this metaphor of a, of a giant urn full of balls. Um, and, and you can sort of see human history as the process of reaching into this urn and extracting one ball after another. These balls represent ideas, technological discoveries, the products of human creativity. And um, throughout our tenure here on this planet, we have extracted a great number of these balls. And um, most of them have been good. Some of them have been mixed blessings. Um, none has been such that it has spelled our disaster. We might wonder, what would it be like if, if there were one of these black balls in the urn? Is there some possible discovery, some technology that could be invented such that it invariably spells the doom of the civilization that discovers it? Um, you could run a kind of counterfactual thought experiment and, and think back um, 100 years ago or 80 years ago before nuclear weapons had been invented. And, and you can ask yourself what would have happened if it had turned out that instead of requiring highly enriched uranium or plutonium, like really difficult processes to, to unleash the power of the atom. What if there had been some simple way? Um, something like baking sand in your microwave oven or something like that, right? So, so now we know that you can't have a, a nuclear weapon by baking sand in your microwave oven, but before we did the relevant physics, how could we have known how it would turn out? Like it could have turned out like that. And 
in that scenario, that might well have been the end of human civilization at that point, because if anybody, uh, just by doing some simple thing that they can do in the kitchen, could wield the destructive power to kill millions, then it might just be impossible to have cities and concentrated population and so forth. Um, but um, nuclear energy turned out not to be a black ball, but may maybe a gray ball instead. Um, so it looks like our strategy currently is to continue to pull balls out of this urn and just hope that there isn't a black ball in there, because if there is, we will eventually pull it out, and then that would be the end of it. Um, we have a lot more ability to invent things than to uninvent things. Right? Um, so, so this is a general reason also for thinking that the biggest existential risks over the course of a century might be from <coughs> possible future discoveries that we might make. Um, and I've put up a, a partial list here of, of some of the perhaps more likely candidates for areas where existential risks might emerge. Uh, there are several things to notice about this list. Also, all of these um, technologies here have great potential for beneficial uses, um, which um, paradoxically is one of the factors that makes them go higher up on this list because it increases the likelihood that we will actually develop them. If, if there was some technology whose only use was to cause destruction of humanity, then maybe we would have a greater likelihood of steering care of that. But if it's something that has wide beneficial impact for health and environment and economy, chances are we will eventually develop these. Um, another thing to notice about this is, is that um, at the bottom there, I've put in um, some unknowns. So if you think again back 100 years ago and uh, consider what the answer would have been, if you at that time would have asked, what are the biggest existential risks over the next couple of centuries? Then none of the ones that we might now be tempted to put near the top of this list would have been mentioned. I mean, certainly not machine intelligence. They didn't even have computers. Um, synthetic biology wasn't a concept. Nanotechnology was not a concept. They might have worried some about totalitarian tendencies. But for the most part, um, what now seems to be the biggest risks are ones that have only in recent decades popped up on the radar. And there might yet be others that, that we haven't yet conceived of, um, which is one reason why we think there is potentially a high value in, in doing this kind of research, just in case we can find something else that we might be able to do something about. Um, so now let me transition to speak more specifically about possible concerns from the future of artificial intelligence. At the very most basic level, the, the the, the point is this, that intelligence is an extremely powerful thing. Um, it what makes the difference between the human species and, and our, in many respects, very similar uh, relatives, so the great apes that, that, that share most of our biology and, and only in very recent evolutionary time has departed somewhat. And, and these small differences um, in our brains uh, have resulted in all these vast differences in in our ability now to shape the future of the planet. So it's, it's our small um, increases in intelligence that have enabled us to develop this modern technology and so forth. Um, and it therefore seems plausible, just, just even at first sight, that if, if there ever were a time when machines became uh, as much cleverer than we are, as we are than other animals, then that those machines could be a very powerful shaper of the future. Maybe they would be able to shape the future according to their preferences. Um, and then um, that this, therefore, seems to be a topic that is worth transferring out of the domain of Hollywood movies and science fiction and kind of entertainment and into the arena where academic researchers can begin to think about it um, as a topic wh wh where the goal is not to have fun and be entertaining, but where the goal is to develop like, increasingly accurate beliefs and proposals. Um, so Max was already um, mentioning some of the uh, advancements that have been made, some milestones that have been crossed. If we look under the hood behind these applications, then we see a great number of um, developments in algorithmic techniques th that have occurred, and pretty much all of these uh, really only since, you know, in, in the living memory of a lot of people alive today. I mean, the computer is still quite young. And so if we think about how far we have come in these past 70 years, uh, yeah, it, it's makes one realize that within the lifetime of us or our children, that we might come perhaps all the way. Um, in addition to these advances in uh, algorithmic design and architecture, there have always been um, developments in, in hardware. And, and if you look at particular domains, say chess computing, you find that roughly half of the improvements in performance have been due to computers getting faster and, and half due to better algorithms. And, and that, as a rule of thumb, seems to 
be true across the board, that both hardware and software are contributing roughly equally. Um, in recent years, as in maybe the recent two or three, four years, there have been a, a new sense of excitement in uh, the world of artificial intelligence, a sense of having come on, unstuck, that, that the field was kind of stagnating a little bit before, but now, particularly with developments in, in what's known as deep learning and some other techniques, there is a sense of renewed progress, a lot of exciting frontiers to explore. Um, also reflected in industry activity with some, some high profile acquisitions and the kind of war for talent among some of the large software companies of the world. Um, we find um, artificial intelligence already in wide application th throughout the economy. Um, I'm not going to read off the whole list, but a lot of the um, in inventions that were originated in artificial intelligence research laboratories um, we no longer tend to think of as artificial intelligence. Once they actually work, they just become software. And this sometimes frustrates AI researchers that they don't kind of get credit for all the things that, that have been accomplished. But, but, but AI techniques are in widespread use already and, and that, that list will continue to grow longer. If, if we look, for example, at a game AI as one particular area where it's easy to compare human and machine performance, we find that machine intelligence already um, in, in, in many games perform as well as or better than human uh, beings. Um, I, I think that the next big game where, where computers will uh, exceed us will probably be the game Go, which is kind of the Asian equivalent to chess, a big board game, great complexity. Um, some challenges that, that remain um, uh, today is um, better methods for transfer learning. This is um, the kind of uh, technology would need to be able to use insights that you learn from solving one problem and then apply them in a very different area. And this is still uh, something of a challenge that AI researchers are working on. Concept learning, more flexible reasoning with learned concepts as opposed to just sort of symbolic tokens that don't mean anything. Long range hierarchical planning, reading, um, and more complex system architectures like the you might get a slightly different list depending on which AI researcher you ask, but, but these are certainly some of the major outstanding challenges that stand between where we are now and replicating the full um, functionality of the human mind, the learning ability and planning ability that makes the human mind so powerful. Um, so reflecting on these developments, um, I think as Max said that it's very important <coughs> to, to make a clear uh, an emphatic distinction between the near term and long term. Uh, both of these contexts have serious legitimate challenges and opportunities to think about, but they're quite different. So in the near term, we have uh, issues such as um, autonomous weapons um, that Max mentioned. We have, of course, uh, non-autonomous applications of these. So you could have, in many situations, perhaps the human making the final decision by pressing a button, but with a lot of AI assist uh, image processing, etc. Uh, you have, in a very different direction, people thinking about the impact of automation on, on the labor market and, and whether um, the problems with chronic unemployment that one is beginning to see in some countries have something to do with, with that or whether it, in fact, has to do with completely other things like offshoring of, of labor or the economic cycle. But as machines become more capable, this is likely to become a, a bigger issue. Um, Surveillance and data mining, of course, um, cybersecurity, uh, self-driving cars have issues for regulators, like exactly what will the legal frameworks be for allowing these on the road, and, and a bunch of other things. And, and these issues are quite different from the issues that arise if we ask the question, what happens if AI actually succeeds in its original mission, which has all along been not just to create um, domain-specific applications, little tools here and there, but actually to do all the things that the human mind can do. Um, and that's obviously farther off, but also the implications are, are much more profound. So um, we did a survey of some of the, um, the world's leading AI experts um, a couple of years ago, and one of the questions we asked was, um, by what year do you think that there is a 50% probability that human level machine intelligence will be achieved, which we defined for the purposes of this survey as the ability to perform um, you know, most jobs at least as well as a normal adult. So, so real, genuine human level machine intelligence. And as you can see, the median answer to that question was 2040 or 2050, depending on precisely which group of experts we asked. Um, and um, 
that um, estimate should be taken with, with a large um, amount of, 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 of salt in that it's based purely on the subjective impressions of people expert in the field, but there is really no science that enables us to predict with accuracy how long these kinds of developments will take. It could happen much sooner or it could take a lot longer. So think instead of a particular year, think of a probability distribution, so smeared out over a wide range of possible arrival dates. Um, th there, there is a, a, a different question also about timing, but which must be distinguished from the first. So, so far, I asked about this kind of first arrow there on the horizontal axis, time until takeoff, like how, how long bef between now and human level machine intelligence. There is a second question, if we ever do reach that level, how long between that point and until we have something that is radically super intelligent? Um, and um, you might be quite pessimistic or optimistic depending on how you look at it, but you might think that it will take a long time before the field of artificial intelligence will actually reach human level. Maybe you think that these um, opinions about the practitioners are biased. Maybe they want to believe that their field is really important and it will succeed. Maybe you think it will take 100 years rather than 50 years or more. Um, you might nevertheless still think that if we ever do reach that level, that the transition to superintelligence will then happen quickly. And in fact, that is my view, that it would be uh, harder to get from here to human level than to get from human level to, to radical superintelligence. Um, and one way to think about it is, is this. And intuitively, we have this notion of, of uh, smart and dumb that, that maybe looks somewhat like this. We think at one end, we have like the village idiot, completely hopeless, bungles everything. And at the other end, you have sort of your favorite scientific guru, with Einstein or Ed Witten or something. And these kind of define the extremes of, of, of human cognitive performance. Um, with regard to how difficult it will be for artificial intelligence to achieve a particular level of performance, However, I think that the picture will look more like this, that we start at the left of this diagram with zero capability um, when we invent computers, let's say, zero artificial intelligence. And then slowly over time, the AI train moves along this track. And after many, many decades of really hard work by a lot of researchers, perhaps eventually we reach mouse level artificial intelligence, something that maybe can navigate a cluttered environment about as well as a mouse can. And then after a lot more work, maybe we reach chimp level, and after a lot more work beyond that, uh, we reach village idiot level. Um, but I don't think that at that point the train will slow down. Uh, I think it will just swoosh past human will station. Um, the, the brain of the village idiot and the brain um, of Albert Einstein are almost exactly identical. The same size, same number of neurons more or less, same biology, uh, there's no particular reason to think that it would be a lot harder to, to match one than, than to match the others. Um, so um, um, to, to wrap up, so what, what I have argued, and I recently wrote, wrote a book on this, is that we then will confront uh, this uh, control problem, which is the problem of assuming it could solve the intelligence problem, like how could you actually make machines intelligent, like how could you then ensure that these very intelligent machines will, will be safe and, and beneficial to humanity? And I argue that this raises unique challenges, um, techni technical challenges uh, and foundational challenges, um, that there are plausible scenarios in which super intelligent systems become very powerful um, for the reasons I alluded to earlier. Like intelligence is a general purpose thing. If you have enough intelligence, you can invent all the other technologies you don't already have. And, and also, as I described in the book, there are these superficially plausible ways of solving the control problem ideas that immediately spring to people's mind that on closer examination turn out to fail. And so there is this open, uh, currently unsolved problem of, of how to develop better control mechanisms that is more difficult because it will need to be solved before we actually have these fully intelligent systems. By that time, we already need to have the solution. So, um, so I'm very glad that um, people like Elon Musk are stepping into the breach here where there has been a complete funding vacuum until recently. And, and that some activity is beginning to happen. Um, and, and I recommend that, um, that, that, that we sort of accelerate this work of establishing a field of inquiry to do foundational and technical work on the control problem and, and recognize that as such a distinct, legitimate academic endeavor that some small number of the world's best brains should be working on, just as so many other things are being studied by academics. Um, that we should try to attract top mathematics and computer science talent into this new field. Um, that we should build strong research collaborations between the AI safety community and the AI development community, both in industry and academia, because ultimately the path to success is that 
whatever ideas for safety are developed also get implemented and, and both of these need to learn from one another rather than take up antagonized positions. Um, that in long range scenarios and planning, we should consider superintelligence as a possibly important factor in shaping humanity's long term future. This does not commit one to thinking that this is just around the corner, that we should hold our breath and be like super excited about every single announcement in the media. But, but if you're really thinking long term about humanity's future decades out, then I think this is a legitimate thing to take into account. And finally, um, that it is important to um, integrate into this research community and into society's thinking about the long term future of artificial intelligence, that this is a, a unique technology that should be developed um, only for the, for the common good of all of humanity. It's too big to just be thought of as something that will raise the profits of one firm a little bit or give one country a slight edge. This is really a concern for all of us. Everybody in the world, if this is developed, will share in the risks, whether they like it or not. Um, and it also seems fair that everybody should stand to, to gain uh, if, if things go well and, and have a slice in the upside. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you very much for this uh, absolutely great presentation and, uh, and one of the recommendations